And I'm going to walk you through a little bit, at least from my perspective, something about the, what it is and why we need these facilities and how you can use them. I'm going to focus specifically also on the techniques that are provided by, uh, at Formax as well. And this is also because those are the ones that I'm more familiar with myself. Um, so I think all of us here are, share somewhat a common fascination about the materials that we find in the plant world and maybe in particular trees. Um, so a lot of the properties of the tree is really set already on the microscopic scale where you find these really complex structures that have been tailored over a million of years to really optimize the function of the tree, the stability, the water transport, uh, and uh, to enhance sort of the species survival then. But if you want to find the building blocks of all of these structures, you need to go to the nanometer scale. And that is like a million times smaller than a millimeter. Uh, and these same building blocks can be utilized to design uh, new types of materials that can benefit us with structures and properties that might be useful uh, for the materials that we want. Uh, but in order to do that, uh, we really need to understand these building blocks, the, the properties of it. For example, these cellulose nanofibers then that are imaged here. Um, their properties, their interactions, and how they will behave in material processes. Uh, and to understand that, you really need to be able to see on a nanometer scale. Um, and this is a little bit easier said than done. Um, so I think when looking at small stuff, we might think about, why we just put it in a microscope and, and look at it. What's the big deal? Well, the problem is that, well, you have a microscope, you usually have a visible, uh, so a light source with visible wavelengths of light uh, going through your material collected by lenses and you look at your object and this is how the, the object interacts with the beam through absorption and reflection of the light and you will see this kind of image. But what happens when the objects that you want to image are sort of on the same order of magnitude as the wavelength and even smaller, you start getting diffraction. It might be uh, the, the light starts to scatter and might be difficult to distinguish the objects themselves. So it is a problem really to look at small stuff with a regular optical microscope. But we have techniques to look at the really, really small scale. We have techniques to look at even atomic scale uh, resolution of, of, of objects. This, I think, is a prime example of that. You know a lot about yourself, electron microscopy, where you have electrons that are accelerated through a vacuum tube through the sa your sample you collect uh, on the detector. You can also, since these are associated, the electrons themselves have sort of a wavelength, but it's much, much smaller than the visible wavelengths. So you don't really get uh, the kind of diffraction problems here to form the image. That's quite neat. And uh, we have other techniques also. For example, atomic force microscopy works on a completely different principle. It's not that you shoot some particles, photons or whatever through your material. You have a cantilever that is scanned over your sample. You're measuring the height of the cantilever through a laser and a detector. You can measure that really accurately. And you can image your cellulose nanofibers here as, really, as a height map which is also very useful. You can also go down to really atomic resolution with these techniques. But why, why are we really interested then in, in other techniques? We have ways of imaging and looking at stuff at the smallest scale. Well, as with all techniques, there are certain limitations. I, I list a couple of these here, for example, that often you are limited to dry static samples. You, have difficulties seeing anything happen over time. It's usually restricted to 2D projections. You might lose the three-dimensional information of your sample. And also might be just operational things. Might be that you have, need to have very thin samples, specialized sample preparation and holders. The operation in vacuum makes it very limited in what kind of things you can really look at and how to prepare it if easily. And that's where x-rays, I believe, can uh, bridge some gaps that exist. Uh, X-rays, just electromagnetic radiation, just like the optical microscope, so to say, uh, 
but with much, 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 much smaller wavelengths. And the nice property of these is that they are highly penetrating. They can penetrate through quite a lot of material, as opposed to visible light, which is quite easily blocked. But x-rays, as you might know, you have probably taken a medical examination yourself. It can actually go through quite a lot of material. And you can have them, your sample in an open sample environment. You can place basically anything in front of the x-ray beam uh, and look at it. And you often need very little sample preparation for these experiments. Asterisk, it depends on technique, yes. But in order to utilize x-rays to look at stuff at a nanoscale, you need some certain properties of these x-rays. It doesn't work to just put your sample in, uh, at, the, at the hospital in, in the CT scan and think that you will understand anything on a nanometer scale. You usually get like millimeter resolution on those things. So you need better x-rays. You need some properties, almost like laser-like properties of the light. That is what is desired. You want highly parallel x-rays. You would like to have them at single wavelength. So it's not a mixture of all various colors, but rather very uniform in wavelength. If we manage to achieve those properties, parallel and single wavelength, we are said to have coherent light. And if we also get a lot of them per, uh, per second and per area, that then uh, we have very intense light source with parallel and single wavelength light. And that means we have very high brilliance. I think the standard definition you should also add that this should be a very small source size, if I remember the expression correctly. But, and I think you, you sort of see where I'm going with, uh, with this. Where, where do we generate such x-rays? Well, that is at these kind of synchrotron facilities. Uh, so we need these huge buildings to create x-rays like this. Uh, it's not like the laser pointer that you can put in your pocket. Uh, you need a little bit bigger stuff here. So how do they work? Basic principle, you accelerate electrons to almost the speed of light. And you can change their trajectory by applying magnetic fields. So magnetic force to the electrons through bending magnets. And then you can change the direction at which these super fast electrons are going. You put them sort of in a loop like this. You can store these super fast electrons going around in a ring like this. So you have this storage ring of very fast moving electrons. Whenever you change the trajectory of an electron, you're applying a force, which means you're applying, or it will experience a centripetal acceleration. Uh, and whenever an electron, or any charged particle for that matter, is accelerated, it will emit electromagnetic radiation. And in this case, it will emit X-rays. And just purely because of relativistic effects, this emission of radiation will really be in the direction of the velocity of the electrons in themselves. So light will be, this, these X-rays will be generated whenever you're sort of changing the trajectory of these electrons. And what we do is we place so-called beam lines wherever this light is generated so that we can extract it. And those are our experimental stations there where we can use the X-rays to conduct our research. I also have a footnote. Today we can wiggle around the trajectory of these electrons even more with various arrays of, of magnets to create even better X-rays. But this is the basic principle. We have super fast moving electrons. We change their trajectory. They emit X-ray radiation, synchrotron radiation. And what, can we, what type of research can we do? I think this is the most straightforward one, which is imaging. Basically that you just shoot your X-rays through your sample, you're sort of measuring how much is absorbed. If you have some object here, it will absorb some X-rays more than the space outside it. And that means you form an image, right? You, you see this shadow image here will be an image of your system. Um, and usually at synchrotrons, because also it's very flexible, you usually combine this with tomography. So you rotate your sample in front of the beam you collect a lot of these various shadow images from different rotation directions, and you can reconstruct exactly the three-dimensional uh, structure of your sample. And as an example, you, or you can do this with things during processes, for example. It doesn't need to be a static sample here. You can place whatever, uh, again, in the beam. I will show some example from 
my, my own work. This was um, as a master student, I was doing this in Switzerland 12 years ago, placing and operating hydrogen fuel cell at the Tomcat beamline, a Swiss light source. So here we combine hydrogen and oxygen into water and electricity. And we do this and we, we have it operating while also doing tomography of it. And then we could directly see how water is created and where it's located within this carbon fiber network inside the fuel cell to see how it's affecting this gas diffusion layer properties. And of course you can label various pixels here or rather voxels, volumetric pixels in this tomogram and you can get really the sort of appreciation of the three-dimensional thing you're looking at. And this is, yeah, during operation or whatever. And uh, another example from the same beamline that is usually shown here, and I will show it as well, just to see that this can be really time resolved as well. You have sub-micrometer resolution of this blowfly that is stuck on a rotation stage here while it's moving its wings, and you can time resolve exactly how things are moving within this blowfly during its flight. Yes, it's not really a very nice experiment for the fly. It can, of course, not really survive this, but it's kind of nice demonstration at least what is possible. So this is somewhat what you can do with imaging techniques at the synchrotron. Uh, and, but th there are some sort of fundamental limitations of imaging that like to, it's, it's sort of, you probably know this already, but it's good to just reiterate because it will lead me into the next topic. One thing is that there's always a trade-off between resolutions and significant, uh, resolution and significance. It means that if you really want to look at the smallest, smallest scales in your sample, you need to zoom in. Right? You need to look closer and closer, and that means you lose your field of view, you lose the significance. You might zoom in on one part of your sample, but you're not sure if the small scale features of what you're looking at is really significant for the rest of your system. You might need to take a lot, a lot of images until you can get such statistics. Another fundamental thing uh, with, with imaging is that you might think that you can increase significance by just adding more stuff in your image. But at some points, this will sort of blur your image, right? You add more and more and more stuff, it's more difficult to distinguish what it is you're really looking at. And that's also usually why you need thin or dilute samples when you're doing image. And the third thing that I want to mention is that there's also usually a problem with dynamics. If you have stuff moving in your sample during exposure, you might end up with images like this. It blurs out the image because you have the sample moving. You might be able to decrease your exposure time, but that means you might lose photons more or less. You, you lose uh, contrast that way instead. But there are, is a way to really... Uh, oh, uh, I also want to mention that this is a problem specifically on the nanoscale. Stuff tends to not really be completely stationary on a nanometer scale, mainly due to brown in motion. You have sort of molecules hitting your sample from all directions all the time, and it's difficult to keep it really stationary to that degree. One other problem, of course, of having nanometer resolution, for example, in tomography, uh, is just like completely practical things. It's usually that if you want to have nanometer resolution, you basically need to have samples that are at least like micrometer sized and that is still very hard to handle if you think about your hair being like tens of micrometers thick. If your sample needs to be thinner than that it's very difficult to sort of place on the rotation stage. So it might be some of these limits that are uh, there especially for the smaller, smaller scales with imaging. Um, but that leads me into the other complementary technique uh, which I'm also more familiar with, and that is scattering diffraction. And previously I was talking about this as a problem of looking at small stuff. You have the scattering disturbing your image. You cannot really distinguish things because it scatters the light. But the light is not scattered completely randomly. The sort of pattern to which your object scatters light has information in it. So it's very specific depending on what you're looking at. And you've probably seen this already, but you might not be completely aware that that is what you have been observing. Uh, I like this 
example of typical light scattering, looking at distant lamp posts through a net curtain. You can test this at home, for example. You would probably start seeing these cross-shaped patterns around the lamp post with even visible wavelengths here of the scattered light. And how this pattern looks like will actually tell you something about the, the sizes of the horizontal and vertical threads inside of your curtain. And the same is true even on the smaller scale. If we have another, uh, if we have X-ray as the light source and have another sample there uh, with some structure in it, you can determine uh, the properties about the objects from the scattered light. So for example, if you have scattering of a cubical particle, it will look very similar to what I've already shown you. It will scatter light mainly uh, horizontally and vertically here, or according to the sides of the cube here. If you have a very large cube, you will see very small wavelengths here, while the smaller cube will rather be very long wavelengths on the detector. If you have a fiber, it will mainly just scatter light perpendicular to the fiber orientation, so you can really determine the fiber orientation here through the scattering. If we have a sphere, you can see that you have rather these circular patterns uh, showing up. Again, describing the size of the particle. Spheroids, similar. You see also if we drag out the spheroid, you also get this scattering mainly perpendicular to the spheroid or orientation. Well, scattering techniques have some benefits on the small scale compared to imaging. Uh, one being that small stuff scatter light at uh, wider angles. So it's sort of easier to see the smallest things. So the smaller the things, the e more easy it is to really detect. Otherwise, it's too close to the direct beam of light here. So that is a nice thing. That's sort of the opposite to, to imaging, right? It's more difficult to look at the small stuff. If you have more stuff in the beam scattering your light, you just increase the contrast and increase the significance. You just get better and better data, more or less, up until a point, of course, where distances between your particles become uh, very small, but then you get additional features that you can also look at. So that is also good compared to what I showed you already with, with imaging techniques. And that moving stuff is no problem. If you have a sample with, with small particles here, moving around due to Brownian motion, this is what you will see on the detector. It will not change. It's just the pattern is relative to the beam position, but the fact that these are moving around doesn't change the pattern here. So it's no problem looking at small Brownian stuff with scattering or looking at them. You can determine sizes here of your objects. The best thing you can look at really with x-rays and probably why the first thing you look used x-rays for is crystallography. And that is because when you create periodic structures inside your sample, you will have much sharper features on your detector. You will have more or less these dots, these diffraction spots showing up on your detector, which describes sort of how closely spaced these objects are. And maybe you have small crystallites in your sample like this, then of course, you should have these dots on the detector and they will depend on the viewing angle where they show up on the detector. But you can reconstruct, again, the three-dimensional structure by rotating it in the beam. In a typical sample, I would say, though, that you have maybe a collection of small crystallite elements in all kinds of orientations. And this is more typically what you would see in the experiment, probably. You have rings on the detector instead. You're sort of average over all orientations in your sample, but still the location here of the, these rings on the detector will tell you uh, the structure of it. Uh, and if we have oriented system, this will uh, rather show up as arcs here on the detector. And from this intensity along a single radius here on the detector, you can determine the orientation distribution inside your sample. So there is a still a lot of information in this scattered signal. I think this is a nice example. Just This is a typical intensity versus radius, or scattering angle here, of a system of cell dispersed cellulose nanocrystals. One image, less than one second exposure, but we studied bo at both small angles and wide angles. At the wide angles, you see these peaks showing up here corresponding to periodic arrangements on the molecular scale. 
so really the structure inside of your uh, cells nanocrystals, and this is averaged over all the billion nanoparticles that's probably in there in the beam, highly statistical. You have in the smaller scattering angles, you have information about the cross, average cross-section of your nanocrystals. Uh, and if you go to even, it's like zooming out of your sample, zooming in and zooming out of your sample. You have all that information in one image. If you go to even smaller angles, you're probing structural arrangements on a much higher scale. So how the individual crystals are arranging periodically in these chiral pneumatic states. So I think this shows really what is possible with, with X-ray scattering. You have statistical information on all length scales at once and probed super quickly. You can combine this, you can actually form images through scattering as well. This is an example of that, for example, what we did as commissioning experiments uh, at Formax. So this is Formax results from our uh, beam time in November. You shoot the X-rays at various positions in a flow cell. We have flowing cellulose nanofibers here in the dispersion that is focused by sheath flows of water. You shoot the beam at various positions in the channel. You analyze the scattering pattern for each of those positions and you can extract certain quantities. And if you do this for a lot, a lot of pixels here or positions in the channel, you can form an image of what the thing that is inside there. So this is the focused flow of the cellulose nanofibers. We can see where we have a lot of nanofibers present and what uh, their degree of alignment throughout the channel and so on. So in this way, you can scan uh, your beam and form an image like this. You can combine scattering with tomography as well. Uh, I think this is a prime example of that, uh, where they placed uh, this tooth sample on the rotation stage, collecting scattering patterns at um, very, a lot, a lot of various points through a sample and through some clever reconstruction. You can start adding the nanoscale information into your tomogram. So here is the information about the nano-sized collagen fibrils inside of the tooth provided directly from the scattering then. This will not be visible in the regular tomogram because it's too small. You can also combine, uh, or you don't need the, your beam to really be transmitted through the sample. You can have it grazing on top of a surface and study structures of thin films and, and, and surfaces. Also on a nanometer scale, I just put, add that there. There are other techniques like X-ray reflectivity, for example, you can use to study thin films as well. This is what I at least really enjoy about synchrotron uh, research in general, is that you can really design your own custom environment. You can basically take whatever lab equipment you have already used, maybe with optical techniques in your lab, and then place in front of the x-rays and, and do the complementary study. You can build up something with flow and mixing, maybe add external forces through tensile pressure, electromagnetic, thermal, whatever you want to study, processes uh, that you can study, uh, which might be very difficult to do with, for example, electromicroscopy or, or these techniques. But there are, um, of course, some caveats with, with X-ray science as well. I would probably uh, not do myself any favor in trying to hide this. Um, but you always need to be careful with radiation damage of your sample. Yes, x-rays is harmful to biological samples. And you need to be careful how you measure it, not using too high dose. Maybe seeing that x-ray dose doesn't affect your results. Another tricky thing I would say is interpretation of scattering patterns. I would uh, advise you to team up with perhaps somebody with more experience and knowledge about this. I think it, it really requires to have you to have good, a good hypothesis about the sample to start with. You probably need to have some idea which you probably need complementary techniques for. For example, you need to see, is your sample cellulose nanofibers really? Well, go to an electron microscope and check first. Um, and then you can interpret based on what you already know about your sample. Otherwise, it's, it is more or less just noise. It's very difficult to have a scattering pattern telling you exactly what it is, and you don't need anything else than that. To end, just there are a lot of other techniques at the Synchron that I haven't mentioned. 
Uh, I think it's very fascinating, especially the kind of techniques that show up uh, when you have a synchrotron with very high coherence, which Max4 has. You can do chemical analysis, you can scan through beam energies and see how your material absorbs uh, various energy levels of your X-rays. That gives you a chemical footprint of your sample. Now you have these kind of nanoscale imaging and dynamics techniques that really make use of coherent beams as well. Uh, I won't go into that more. From my side, at least, I think there are really plenty of reasons to be excited about what's going on right now. Um, first of all, we have arguably the best synchrotron in the world right now here in Sweden, a couple of or close by here. Uh, I think that's cool. I've been doing experiments at these facilities before, needing to travel all around the globe to try to get experimental time to come into these facilities. It's very competitive to get in and you need to bring all of your research equipment uh, on the plane uh, through security and all of these things. No, now we have this here in Sweden. Uh, there is a beam line that is designed and dedicated to study forest materials. Uh, and that itself is amazing. There's, I have not seen anywhere else that they, here you have actually personnel that knows about these samples. Um, and we have privileged access to that beamline, which is, again, amazing through tree search. So, uh, and soon we will also have like the best neutron characterization source right next door to it, of course. Uh, it's not up yet, but you can do a lot of it really cool stuff there when it's up. You will probably hear a lot more about it in the next 10 years. Uh, but I, I think as, as a scientist within this field, I'm, I'm super excited with what's going on right now. I'm so happy that we have experiments now running at Formax. It looks great. And uh, yeah, I encourage you all to try it out. Um, and with that, I, uh, I don't have anything more to say regarding this. I know we will hear more about the Formax Beamline specifically from Kim now. Um, but I'll, I'll be around. Please let me know if you're interested in doing science like this and, and discuss what can be possible. So, yes, thank you.